Hello everybody, we're just waiting for people to join the call. We'll give it a few moments before we get started. Good morning, everybody. We're just waiting a few more moments for a few more people to join the call and then we'll get started. I can see that numbers are fairly static right now, so we'll get started. Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm really pleased that you've decided to join us today. My name is Ashley Callard, and I'm the Communications and Engagement Manager at Governors for Schools. Today, we're going to be focusing on a very important topic of supporting students with special educational needs and disabilities to access careers education. Now, the impact of the past two years has been a challenge to say the least particularly when it comes to careers education, and ensuring that the provision is meeting the needs of all students is never an easy task. Children with special educational needs and disabilities may face many more barriers to accessing the workplace in comparison to some of their peers. And as such, it's important that we as governors are ensuring that the school careers provisions that we support are fit for purpose and really are meeting the needs of the learners that we're serving. Now, here at Governors for Schools, we wanted to help governors understand what they can do to ensure that the careers education that their school offers is fit for purpose, is suitable for the needs of the learners that they're supporting, and takes their needs into account. It's really important that we as governors are supporting this in terms of the heart of strategic planning and decision making, which is why we thought about today's focus for our webinar. Now, we're very pleased to be joined by Penny Hayes and Penny Bliss. And both of our speakers today will be showcasing their experiences for us so that we as governors can reflect on our own careers provision at school and hopefully that we'll be able to learn from the case studies and the experiences that they're sharing. Before I begin today, I'd just like to mention a few bit of housekeeping points as ever. Now today's webinar is going to be recorded and you're very welcome to share this with your colleagues at school and on boards after the webinar. The easiest way to do this is by sharing the email that you'll get after the webinar, which will include links to the slides, as well as links to the recording itself. If you have any questions for Jenny or Penny, we'd be delighted to hear them. Please use the Q&A feature um, at the bottom of the chat, and we're going to have time at the end of today's presentation to hopefully ask some of those questions live. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce this morning's first speaker, Penny Hayes. Penny is Enterprise Coordinator at Inspira and is also a Link Governor for Careers at a mainstream school with an SEM provision in Lancashire. Penny, thank you so much for being here today. I'd like to hand over to you. That's great. Thanks ever so much, Ashley. And uh, it's lovely to meet everybody and to be able to share a little bit of my limited expertise with everybody on the call today. Um, if I could just share my screen, that would be great. One second. So, um, delighted to be here to present to you all. My name is Penny Hayes. I'm up in the lovely sunny Lancashire today and I am the Enterprise Coordinator and I also lead on the SEND provision in Lancashire as well. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm the Enterprise Coordinator. I support 16 schools and colleges. I've uh, been in the role for six years. I absolutely love the job. I love making a difference. Um, I'm a, an ex-further education teacher as well. Um, I'm also the career governor at the Lancashire Lead Career Hub School, which is in Padium in Lancashire. And I lead on Send an Alternative Provision for Lancashire, which consists of 46 schools as well. I bring those together into what's called an inclusion community of practice, where they can share best knowledge, uh, best practice, case studies, and split out into different working groups as well. Um, I've got an extensive careers experience and as I said, I've previously worked for 15 years in a further education college. So that's just a little bit about me. So the school that I'm linked to is um, Shuttleworth College in Lancashire. It's a mainstream, mixed 11 to 16 foundations is secondary. Their motto, which I think is really vital here, is think big, chase dreams and succeed together. 
They have a real passion and they believe that regardless of academic ability, they expect huge things from their young people and they set them up to be the very best that they can be in their future lives. When you get the slides afterwards, I've included the link there for you to be able to have a look at what that looks like on their websites, particularly from a governor's perspective, to see whether or not your school that you're working with are really shouting about the excellent work that they do for their SEND and most vulnerable students. And so, Lee, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, um, but can I just check, are you trying to share your screen right now? Just because yes. I can't see your screen in front of me, I'm afraid. I do um, apologise. So Let me just go back to my Zoom. One second. Indeed, I was. I'll let you know as soon as it comes on. Don't worry. That's perfect. I can see you. Are we there? Now. Lovely. Let me just see if it will let me do the... Um, one second. Where is the now? Uh, one second. Is it on now, Ashley? So I can see the presentation shared on Teams. So um, you just need to do the... If you click on it, and then you just need to share the presentation from the start. So right now I can see the it's basically the very front page of the screen i can see all of the slides can you all oh right okay let me wait bear with me one second bear with me one second i do apologize because you can see one second let me just share that again share screen and on to here yep can you see it now Oh, it's loading for me. I'm not sure about anyone else. Oh, I do hope so. Can you see that? So I can see that, but for me, it's gone back to the same slide, the same way it was shown before. So for, it's gone on Teams, so I can see. I do apologise. Let me just stop it a second. And it worked perfectly before, didn't it, when we, uh, when we tried oh, it? The joys of live webinars. What I will say is whilst um, Penny is getting the slides prepared, we have had a question come in, which is, will we get the slides after the presentation? We, we will. Everyone will get access to those slides. So Can, in you, the see email, Can you see that, Ashley, now? Oh, it's still loading for me, I'm afraid. Do you want to pop Jenny on? <laughs> or do you want me to carry on? To see if it's loading for everybody else? I don't think it would be, I think it shows in real time, so I'm hopeful it's loading for everyone else. Um, what we could do, is, would you like us to share the slides directly? Uh, yes, do you want me to send those over to you? Yeah, if you could um, send the most, those over and we can share them for you. And if you'd like to continue and we'll get that sorted. Yeah, no problem. If I send that over to you now. Thank you. The slides do come out after the webinar. They'll be available alongside the recording as well. So you can get access to those via email. They also go onto our website, so if for whatever reason you lose the email or you can't access your email, you can access the presentation recording and slides directly from the Governors for Schools website. There you go, Ashley. I've sent that over to you now. Thank you. Apologies for the interruption, everyone. Penny, if you'd like to continue. And we'll, um, we'll share our end. I'm afraid that information that you've just sent hasn't gone through. Would you like to continue on with your presentation without sharing the slides? And then as soon as we get them, we'll be able to show them on the screen. Yeah, no problem. Okay, dokie. Yeah, we will have these slides. I do apologise for the inconvenience. I really do. Okay, so um, if I just go on to um, the... Uh, so I shared with you the Shuttleworth College in Lancashire. Um, for the Ofsted inspection areas, I know we've got different abilities of governors and different levels of knowledge here as well. So just to recap on the four inspection areas. So obviously we've got behaviour and attitudes, personal development, leadership and management, 
and quality of education. And when you look at what the Ofsted inspectors are going to be looking at, they've really, they've really honed in on three different things, which is intent, implementation and impact. So again, just for anybody who's new to governance, just to give you a really quick overview of that, the intent is the framework of what you're setting out to do. What do you aim to do with your programme? The implementation is the way in which that's brought together and way in which the curriculum is taught. And the impact is on how do you measure this? What's the difference that undergoing that activity has, has that student or that pupil or that group of pupils actually had? Um, so when inspectors come into school for governors, they'll look at four specific areas. They'll look at the senior leadership and for those, then, for them, they'll question them around the intent. They'll look at the subject leaders and teachers and for that, they're going to look at implementation. They'll look at the pupils and they'll look at the implementation and the impact. And for us as governors, which is absolutely key, they'll look at the intent, what are we setting out to do and why? And then they'll also look at the impact. And what they're looking to do is make sure that what the school says that they are doing is actually what they're doing in every single aspect of the education. So it's a real common thread right through from all the pupils to the teachers, to senior leaders, heads of school and right into governance as well. So just putting the SEND students into context, pupils with SEND have a real wide range of different needs and starting points. Some pupils have very severe and complex and profound needs that have a significant impact on the cognitive development, whereas other pupils have different starting points and they may be at least as high as some of the other students in their peers or their age, and an example of that is pupils with any sensory impairments. All parts of the education for inspection framework apply to state funded non maintained special schools and mainstream schools, and especially for students with SEND. However, as with all provision, SEND provision has some specific factors that should also be taken into account. What I've tried to do is think about my role both as a careers practitioner and also as a careers governor who leads on careers and SEND within a mainstream school. And what I've done is I've looked at the common inspection framework and looked at some questions and picked some out that might just give you some examples of governors of the questions that you might like to ask. Some of these questions you might already know the answers to, some of, you, some of the questions you might not have thought about. Um, and because time is limited, I've just picked out a few, a few key ones for you to give you some examples about what we should be looking for. So some key considerations. One of the first ones is, are leaders ambitious for all pupils with SEND? So some of the questions that you should ask around that is, how is the curriculum differentiated? And what is the intent? How is it delivered? And why is it delivered in that way? Does the intent raise aspirations for all of the pupils? And do they have the ability and the opportunity at different touch points to achieve? One of the second questions is how well do learners identify, access and meet the needs of, uh, how, sorry, how well do leaders identify, assess and meet the needs of specific learners with SEND? So by that we're meaning, how do, they, how do they come to those conclusions? How do they find out who those SEND learners are and how do they know what their specific needs are? So some of the questions around that might be, how and when, are the individual pupil need identified? And how does this differ from the mainstream careers offer? Who's involved in this process? And that might be internal and external, because often with SEND pupils, there's a lot of people involved in that journey. Another key consideration is how well do leaders develop and adapt the curriculum so that it's coherently sequenced to all pupils' needs? Where are the starting points and what are their aspirations for the future? So some of the questions around that, is there a separate strategy for SEM pupils? How is it monitored? How is it assessed? How is it reviewed? And importantly, how is that reported, not just internally in school, but also to leaders, heads and to governors as well? Is there a clear link between the years and the key stages? 
that really builds on that previous lesson learned through those social development skills. How successfully do leaders involve parents, carers, and other professionals or specialists when deciding on the best support for pupils with SEND? So questions around that, who, how is the pupil, teacher, and parent, parental engagement gathered? How is it fed back on? How does this use to, to plan the SEND strategy? And is there additional support available for SEND parents to communicate your career's offer? What are the touch points for communication opportunities? And again, key to that is how is this reported? And finally, how well do leaders include pupils with SEND in all other aspects of school life? So all pupils, regardless of ability, should be able to partake in both internal and external curriculum as well. So one of the questions around that is what curriculum and external curriculum opportunities are available? If these are limited in school, how could these be differentiated to make them inclusive? And how does this offer link with the community, the area, the pupil, the social economic needs and support progression into realistic opportunities for our SEND pupils? So from all those questions, you can see there's a lot to be learned about what we do with SEND and the key questions that you can ask from an inspection framework. So what I thought was the best thing to do was to show you the kinds of things that we do at Shuttleworth College, where I am the link governor, and look at how they manage their SEND curriculum and how that works in practice to give you some real life examples of what goes on in school. So the question is, how does this work in practice for Shuttleworth College? So pupils can access as much of the careers curriculum in ma as mainstream pupils. The, pro the, the program is differentiated and it's dependent and bespoke to pupil need. The transition pathways are appropriate for level and the needs and access of the, of the pupils in a very centered approach. The support is identified at level six careers guidance interviews when the career leaders discuss and feedback with pupils, teachers and parents with the level six IAG practitioner. All the EHCP pupils access career support starting in year seven. It's recommended normally in year eight where it starts, but this creates a real positive and supportive relationship with realistic expectations. Shuttleworth has an inclusion hub. Pupils dip in and out of this and transition back into the mainstream school. All pupils access IAG termly, but in, during COVID, they actually, actually access this twice termly just to give that additional amount of support for those learners. During COVID, additional support was also put in place, was focused on positivity for their future transitions. What we found is that particularly with the most vulnerable students in school, there was um, a bit of a lack of understanding of what their future might be. There was a real fear around what was going to be available for them. And this affected the mental health and decision making. So there was additional support put in for that. All the careers activity is differentiated with a focus on pre, post and wraparound support. For example, they have a work experience programme where the mainstream students go out for a full week, but the SEND students and most vulnerable students have two days which are intensive and there's small groups that go out which are really supported internally and externally. There is an enhanced collaboration of work in, in, in the school, everything from the family support workers to the attendance officer, to the heads of year, the hub lead, the SENCO and the inclusion manager. The family support workers also support these SEND students in transitioning to their next steps as well. There's a real specific targeted vulnerable careers plan, including workplace visits, social and cultural capital, and anything that supports those transition pathways. The early identification of at risk of need and send pupils is a priority in school at all levels. The school asks themselves, have we done as much as we possibly can for all pupils to develop them socially, emotionally, morally and culturally to ensure that they have the best possible chance in life? All of this is concludes in data sharing and reporting into senior leadership team 
and really importantly in its governance so that we can ask those challenging questions and linking back to the, to the, to the questions that we had on Ofsted, we've got the evidence there to support a really robust SEND offer. So final considerations from me. Is there a robust career strategy in place that is pupil-centred and where every staff at every level understands the strengths and needs of each pupil, tailored adaptations to the work, to the, to the whole curriculum? Is this promoted and delivered to ensure all inclusive careers curriculum and enabling all pupils to participate in the varied aspects of mainstream school? When you get the slide, you'll have a full list of links. There's quite a few on there. It's mainly links to this careers and enterprise company website, also, also the Autism Society and the Dyslexia Society as well. Um, so there's lots of different uh, aspects of reading there for you. And also there is some careers and enterprise company resources which focus on the support for governors in schools and also the SEND supporting SEND as well. And I'm perfectly happy to answer any questions. I'm sorry there's been a lot of talking and we had a mix up with the slides, but happy to answer any questions that you've got at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Penny. It was really great to hear your insight and experiences within your role as a governor. And I think it was really interesting and certainly a question I'll be asking at the end a little bit more about how the Inclusion Hub works, as I think um, that might be of real interest for many governors, particularly as well using year seven as a good time to be able to build in relationships from a careers perspective, I think was quite innovative as well as, as you mentioned, year eight is a time where many schools will be doing that. So well, thank you very much. And I'd Please welcome any audience members to submit questions and we'll be asking Penny at the end. I'd now like to introduce Jenny Bayliss. Now Jenny is the Deputy Head of Pendle Community High School and Pendle Community High School is a special school for children and young people who have a range of complex special educational needs and disabilities. The school is coincidentally also based in Lancashire and is graded outstanding by Ofsted. Now Jenny I would like to hand over to you. Thank you very much um, and thank you for letting me part, be part of this webinar. Um, just a little bit about me, I've been in my current role uh, or my current school about uh, 15 and a half years, maybe this is my 16th year, but I've been in special ed for um, a lot longer, uh, over 30 years. Um, we, we are a school who have um, students with a wide range of learning disabilities um, and that um, includes young people that would be described as having um, moderate learning difficulties, profound and multiple learning difficulties um, and um, associated things like um, autism or hearing impairments, um, visual impairments and so on. Next slide please. <clears throat> and um, we, we also are based in in quite a deprived area of Lancashire at Pendle um, and and that does have um, a, a very diverse catchment um, area really. We are um, uniquely co-located um, on a campus with the mainstream secondary school and so much so that our, our corridors cross each other we're not we're not a separate building in that way and that is is, is a unique approach which comes with its own challenges I, I might say. Next slide please. Currently we have 159 uh, pupils on roll um, and that we do offer a, a very much a differentiated curriculum according to the learners needs so some of our youngsters with the most profound learning difficulties would um, access a sensory curriculum and uh, those with more um, moderate learning difficulties would um, access a, a subject-based curriculum, more of a traditional model. Um, and then our, our children with um, severe learning difficulties um, would have a mix, mixed economy, really. We also offer a range of accreditation in Key Stage 4 and Key Stage 5. Um, I'm not sure if that was made clear that although we're called Pendle Community High School, we are Pendle Community High School in college, so we go up to 19. And our accreditation at Key Stage 4 and 5 includes literacy, numeracy, um, catering. Um, we've just got approval as a centre for catering, level 1 and level 2 qualifications. And for, for a few of our, our youngsters, 
and I'm, and it is you know a handful um, we would put on GCSE maths um, and that has been part of our inclusion with the mainstream school even though we can do our own GCSE maths next slide please so um, Penny talked a little bit about um, her school and their vision um, and their overall curriculum intent and our, our four pillars um, of our vision which links very much into the the intent of our curriculum and this comes from consultation with our parents and our pupils and from everything that they told us everything that they want for all their children and what the young people want for themselves falls into these four four categories of being safe having positive health and well-being uh, gaining independence in lots of different ways that that can present itself as and improving communication and for us that includes their social interaction uh, and communication skills um, to get along with others next slide please so in terms of linking to our school's strategic priorities um, and these come together to form part of our school improvement plan or school development plan some people call it and it is about ensuring that all of our learners regardless of their starting points whether they've got PMLD or their modular difficulties or etc that whatever we are teaching them that it actually is building towards those next steps and for some of our youngsters it is employment but for others it isn't it is their own bespoke pathway according to their needs and also including that the functional use of literacy and numeracy um, our other um, main priority has been about extending our parental engagement and community community participation and that includes both employers um, and any other local services that are suitable and appropriate to, to meeting that that t total need that holistic approach and you know, though you know outcome measures whatever that might look like for our young people it's not progress eight as it will be in a mainstream school but it's about what is um, their progress of relative to their starting points um, and that ability to use those literacy and numeracy skills even though they're not going to be GCSE um, level two qualifications but it's about how that builds them for the future their future pathway whatever that end point that destination might be and um, so that they can use it as a part of their, their development as, as their lifelong journey really next slide please um, I, I have prepared and it is on the on slide three key aspects of the kinds of activities that we offer to our students and trying to highlight some of the questions and how you as governors can support that student development when I practiced last night there was only enough time for one so we'll see how we get on <laughs> next slide please so this is specifically um, a case study that um, I've used before in my work with Penny about the journey of a young young person. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, but it is just the journey of one young person and it's just an, an example of um, a young person with, with moderate learning disabilities um, who is on that pathway towards employment. Um, it's not the journey for all pupils so this young man um you know we we look in year nine which is our beginning of our <clears throat> uh transition planning process all our youngsters obviously have an education health and care plan but in year nine we really start unpicking what those future pathways might be into the what we call the um preparing for adulthood agenda now he said he wanted to be a mechanic now whether, whether that was something that he'd he'd heard about that he'd seen an advert for was it something that was you know other family members might but you know when we sort of probed him a little bit he, he didn't want to get his hands dirty um and was horrified that when he was shown pictures and, and a, a garage and what of of what it might entail so it probably was just um, a word or, or something he'd heard of maybe it was just something he'd watched on coronation street but didn't really know what the job entailed um, and certainly hadn't really got any firm ideas about what his long term goals were. Uh, and that potentially is to do with, you know, uh, who does really know um, at that age what 
your long-term goals are and even more so for young people with additional needs and also who are often um, living in really challenging circumstances you know from his personal um, perspective he lived in extremely challenging circumstances um, his family including his mother had a genetic life limit limiting condition, a condition called Huntingdon's, that he could have himself. So not only was he to cope with the the demise and deterioration in health of his, his mum and potentially understanding and learning about what that condition would mean for him should he have the gene. And because of additional, you know, things that were going on in his family, um, there was a, a domestic abuse situation. He actually left the family home and went to live with his grandma at age eight. So this is a young man, in addition to his learning disability, in addition to, um, you know, a, a, a significant life changing, um, potentially condition and, you know, the, the potential being a, 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 an, an orphan. Um, he, he's he's got to think about what his future is going to hold, and you know, in those contexts, it, it wasn't necessarily the thing that was on it on his priority list of priorities. Next slide, please. So, what we're trying to do within our um, key stage four and key stage five program is to think about accreditation, but also to think of as many different kinds of opportunities as possible that can give young people um, experiences, develop skills, um, not towards specific jobs necessarily, but that wider um, experience to develop those attitudes and experiences to debate those next steps. So at Key Stage 4, they do a whole range of accreditation, um, which I'll talk about a little bit in a minute, but he achieved through his the PSHE course part of the careers education, an entry level certificate, entry level three certificate in making informed career choices. And then we follow a combined approach within Key Stage 4 and 5 that we have an afternoon where we hold what we call the 14 to 19 groups and that's where we mix Key Stage 4 and Key Stage 5 across a whole range of what would in a mainstream school be options but what we do is a carousel really. Um, and get youngsters to experience different kinds of activities. Apart from the Duke of Edinburgh, where we actually do make them sort of make a commitment to that because that's a long term commitment. Um, so we've had Fire Cadets program run with Lancashire Fire and Rescue. We've had the In Mini Enterprise projects. We've got a whole um, heap of stuff going on with design technology, art projects, including using the Arts Mark um, Awards. It's not on there, but you also work with the, the National Citizen Service and they come in and they do um, the assemblies and what have you. And that is not our offer, but that we facilitate um, them to come in and we support our young people to take part in year 11 and year 12. Um, the Duke of Edinburgh we offer is at, at bronze and silver where we can do both of those and, and making sure that, you know, these projects and these aspects can reach out in a whole range of different ways. They're linked to social action, they're linked to volunteering, um, and, and very flexible in meeting a range of needs. So, you know, for these kinds of elements, they can touch lots of different kinds of students in terms of their abilities. It isn't necessarily just those that are on the employment route. Next, next slide, please. In Key Stage 5, we extend this, so this is in our post-16 um, unit, I've said we, we do offer that Level 2 and Level uh, 1 NFCE catering, um, so that is your low GCSE and your GCSE level. We also offer accreditation for Adult Literacy and Numeracy, um, ICT, which is on the functional skills side. The employability mod modules there, we run the Prince's Trust Achieve program. And so there's all sorts of different um, awards that can be achieved through there. They are at entry level three, which is for some of our students a tall order, but because the flexibility of the kinds of evidence you can um, provide, that actually makes it very accessible for a lot of our students who aren't actually entry level three. And they might be entry level one and entry level two, but because we can provide such a diverse range of, of evidence, that makes it very accessible. 
So things there, that includes preparing for work, running an enterprise, all that community action, solving everyday problems. We offer work-related learning. We have our own campus catering kitchen, which we do share with the mainstream school, where they actually learn about being in that, um, that simulated uh, work environment. We've worked with Digital Advantage or um, Digital Inc, which was the SEND part. Um, and where Andrew participated, he was working um, to create an app, which actually went on to do other things. And we're actually starting a new program in the summer to um, call the uh, Evolving Digital News Agent. So we've still got that, that link with um, Digital Advantage. Work experience, we do offer um, sort of a, a graduated approach. So some of this work experience is supported by staff with with whole class groups. And, you know, our class groups are only sort of 12, uh, 14. And it might be we, we set, take that whole group to um, we have um, a place called Bootham Park, which is on there. They It's a fishing place where we did groundwork, but also they have um, uh, what to call them? I would say huts, but they're not. They're cabins. That's it. Um, and they do um, housekeeping duties as well, but working together as a team. And they'll be up there for a day or half a day, etc. The Good Life Project. That's a local community project um, where they do growing things, but also they have chickens and so on. And the St John's Community Church at uh, Community Lunch um, that was run to local church, and a member of staff would go to students, and they would help the local volunteers set up that community lunch, serve it, um, lay the tables, and, and do all the full full service. So a lot of these are already existing voluntary um, um, voluntary activities, but and we just latch into them. Um, on our own campus, we have our caretaking company, which is Anji, and we have had students working alongside their staff doing the, the caretaking and portage duties. And we have, before COVID, worked in the Lancashire Catering Kitchen that creates the meals for everybody on campus. So that's, you know, 1,500 students, um, and they've been in there um, doing that as well. So we, we've worked on our local contacts as much as anything else. Next slide, please. For some of our youngsters, they might then, in this graduated response, get to an independent work experience placement. Um, and that is included locally somewhere called the A Centre in their um, catering centre at Pendleside Hospice. They, they help support, run the afternoon trolley, but also doing uh, arts and crafts activities with residents. Um, and the Molly May Forest was um, a, a, a teacher who worked with us for a short while. Her daughter's florist and she taught individuals on, on work experience there. So again, it's just trying to you know, grow those connections and they don't, don't come easily. We have included in our offer what we call work eight place encounters and we've used the network rail offer there where students go for a day's experience going on the train and actually meeting um, rail staff and they talk about the the different kinds of jobs that are available and those that are behind the scenes often when you know when you go shopping you don't really know all the people that go to make up that organization and that you know from our students point of view they get to see behind the scenes they get to see you know everything that makes up uh, the shopping experience and so they may not be best place on on a till but they could be in the warehouse or they they there's just so many different jobs you'd never think of um similarly the old fractal shop we've been to um and that came out of um what we had in the careers and enterprise company a couple of years ago, which was called the virtual wallet, and we could buy different things, and that came from a, a provider. Um, and they did go just before COVID to the old factory shop, and again seeing all the different kinds of um, job roles that might be there. Morrison's is also one that we go to, and their community champions at Asda and Morrison's are really supportive of this kind of approach. Independent travel training, that is a key part of our programme because one of the key skills they need in order to get successful employment in the future may be that independent 
travel element where they need to learn to use public transport or um, you know go on the bus and so on and we see that as a barrier to to some young people not being able to access employment because they just simply can't get there and so if they have to get a taxi everywhere it's actually not very um, financially viable because it costs them you know so much in in um, in, in getting there um, we also it's not on here but we have run in the past bikeability courses as well so the old sort of cycle proficiency kind of thing which may be something that some young people might need depending on how far they, they've got to travel again listening to what our young people worry about it's often when they move on what support they're going to get so we do run uh, with a local college nelson and con college the, what we call the college links program which is now called the inclusion project um where our year 14s that are moving on would or anybody that was leaving between year 12 and, and 14 would take part in this transition project and this is about getting our young people to move from a school ostensibly a school setting even though they're post 16 to what it might be in the local fe environment i mean our, our campus and buildings big but going into a different building um and a, a different sort of setup from being maybe with us for eight years that is a huge challenge and so getting them to go and visit and um, getting used to their way around but just how the how it presents really differently to to a to school um we put that on in the summer term starting a bit later this year because of rising covid cases that'll start on the 21st of um april and that builds up to a whole day and that links into it and it's more than just taste of days it's getting them prepared for the next that next step so that that is a key part of, of the um journey that andrew took as well um next next slide please so why why have we put all these things in our offer if you like what why is it important so it is all about that preparation for work it's looking at the skills um, develop the qualities which uh, enables our students to to learn these skills and qualities why it's important um, for employers to to have them and also for the students to begin to explore their own skills and qualities in relation to work and start bringing it closer to a reality um, when they're experiencing some of these activities because it's not just about school it's not just about teachers telling them what to do enterprise is such a wonderfully um, flexible kind of approach to learning all sorts of different kinds of, of, of skills it's independence it's innovation imagination risk taking um, creativity and leadership um, and lots of problem solving they are, you know there's just so many different ways that enterprise can can be used to, to do that the planning encourages individuals and groups to think of the best way um, to achieve a positive outcome and it could be for profit or just just to make the activity successful um, they sell the product they sell the service um, and they can you can build that into letting them keep simple um, but um, accurate and basic records of sales costs profit loss etc and you know sometimes when they've done the sums about when once they've bought all this how much are they going to have to sell it for and what it has cost in terms of their time you, you can see the cogs turning and thinking oh this is not really a very um um it, it's not best use of resources kind of thing so that's a really um important one simulated work environments this is you know that graduated approach to introduce young people to the workplace where they're supported by familiar staff but you're putting you know as many of the real life things in place as possible and that could include wearing appropriate ppe um you know giving them a specific task so in a, in a kitchen in a catering kit they may be somebody just in charge of puddings maybe just in tar charge of um peeling the veg and preparing the veg chopping mixing whatever it might be and so they would develop particular skills around using bits of um equipment or peeling and and having to work to time scales um 
clearing away, washing up, leaving everything tidy, not having the chef, you know, um, telling you off. They've got to use their time management. They've got to be given, um, you know, this is your break time. You need to come back on time. So there's, you know, telling the time or being able to know when they should come back. So you're telling them why, when it's when that hand goes to the 15, you're on your way back and things like that, giving them those sense of responsibility. And often problem solving all the time as things don't always go to plan and for them to you know, have some skills about not necessarily knowing what to do about the, the problem, but going to see someone who can help them. Um, and that is really important in a, a working environment. Um, so I've talked talked a little bit about the supported work experience and how that is the progressive approach, and that's how we we find the best way. Um, not just a, a week of work experience, which in past has has led to sort of not not positive outcomes because it breaks down because our students have found it difficult to do those things independently. Um, next slide, please. Any, Jenny, sorry to interrupt. This is your five minute countdown. Lovely. Thank you. Um, OK, so let's see where we're up to. So how does that link together with some of the things Penny talked about, about the different areas of um, inspection? So, yeah, so what we're trying to do is looking at the um, approach for all learners to gain knowledge and skills for whatever that might mean for their future, their next steps, um, increasing their life chances opportunities and and you know going back to our four pillars about that that independence which is what everybody wants for for their um their young person next next slide please so for going back to to andrew and what the impact had for him was that he did get that awareness of the skills and qualities he needed um just through those different kinds of experiences for different kinds of job roles and for, for him, developing that interest, that confidence um, and motivation to enter the world of work as a, as a realistic aspiration, um, that can-do attitude, that sense of purpose and identity. And if I just remind you about what his challenging circumstances were in terms of this is a young man who, if he has that gene, is going to have a life-limiting condition. And so what it is, does it mean for him um, and, and you know, his future life? And, and that is what he, he gained, that he did really want to, you know, have for however long that would be for him, um, a sense of purpose and identity for him and his future. So we, we actively encouraged him to apply post-19 when he left us, um, something that could develop his employability skills. And he was successful in gaining a place on the project search program, which is a supported internship um, local to us in, in Burnley. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a few pictures of him. So that was a working place encounter at a, at a pop factory. That's him putting together a box um, as part of um, a mini enterprise they'd put um, project on to raise some money so they could buy some items to take to the local um, centre where young people uh, between 16 and 25 go as their first point of call. It's called Safe Space and it's for those young people who are basically at risk of, of homelessness and that was something that they put together. Next next slide please. That's him out in the, in the community, um, doing some work experience at a local golf club. They were doing some grounds work. And I've picked that picture deliberately because I don't know if you can see, but on his back, there is a butterfly. Um, and that was part and parcel of the, the spin-offs when you, you, you get those kinds of supported work experiences. It's not just the working part. It's actually all the other things about them becoming aware of, of, of the world um, and actually taking notice of something like a butterfly. Um, on his back and then there's uh, something in the DT workshop where they were putting together some um, bird boxes as part of a, a project um, we, we did with a, a, a group called Wild Ed. Next slide please. Um, this is um, one of him doing uh, another mini enterprise they were making cupcakes I think but again he was in charge of that and it was his idea and he was having to do some prototypes so yeah. Next slide. 
So for for this case study, it's about how what we provided him um, that yes, it does need to be tailored to the needs of young people with special education needs. They've got an EHCP. He was at a special school and college. Um, and it's about having that can-do attitude, inspiring that uh, in our young people. And we're very much in our school about what our children and young people can do rather than what they can't and trying to find alternatives and, and, and um, accessibility for them, despite their personal challenges um, and educational needs. Um, and he's, you know, a, a great example, as many of our young people are, um, that they are capable of work despite academically achieving far below their peers of the same age and they're not going to have your six eight GCSEs A stars or anything they're not going to have one probably and you know this is sort of part and parcel of our drive to you know get more employees to recognize the skills and qualities that our young people have and see beyond this end oh no it's we can't have we haven't got the right insurance and oh we can't have somebody with them and they won't be quick enough they won't be and it, it isn't, they're all going to be brilliant workers despite their lack of qualifications at GCSE. And he was, you know, the supported internship is a, a great way of getting our young people into that world of work. Next slide. And so just a few questions um, for you as governors. Um, what is your school doing to enable every young person find their best next step, whether it's in employment or not? for you to gain an insight into the careers or vocational education or program within your schools how is it embedded within your curriculum and i've emphasized there in the culture of the school because it's got to be about that this is why we're here this is our sense of purpose what is it about young people's futures that we're we're, we're trying to achieve um, maybe using your contacts with the local community you whether that be employers or the voluntary sector to to make those connections and um, linking the whole school pro uh, improvement priorities to that career strategy because they need to be um, linked, they, they can't be separate in an add-on. And also using um, the careers and enterprise company um, links and supporting that link with the careers lead and having that three-pronged three approach. And I think that's the end of the section. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Jenny. That was a really comprehensive insight and it was really great to see that Andrew was able to secure a place on his internship following that. And I know there are lots of questions coming in from the board and um, for both <laughs> of you. So what I hope to do for the last few moments is take some time to discuss those questions mm -hmm. and I will start now and then we'll pass over. So we've had a question coming in from the audience. What types of data are examined to see how successful your career policy has been? Um, and does this look at long term outcomes? So can we start with Penny on that? Yeah, absolutely. I should look at that. I managed to have a look at the questions beforehand and do some planning. Um, so obviously, I'm the Careers Link Governor there. So we have um, senior leadership uh, members who actually lead on the Ofsted Inspection Framework. So I regularly meet with um, my lead to look at how the careers provision is embedded within the school. Um, we, we meet on a regular basis. We also do school walk rounds as well. So what I do is as well, I check that that actually happens in practice. So I spend a lot of time both um, in normal classrooms where I look at the, uh, I'm more focused on the careers provision and the support for SEND. So I look at what's happening within that and actually what they're saying, what the school is saying within their strategy is happening in practice. Um, and we report that back into curriculum standards and then obviously then that reports back into full governors. Um, we also, through the Careers and Enterprise Company, we have a system called Compass, where we review um, different Gatsby benchmarks that you might have heard of as well previously. So on that, when we look at careers, we look at the uh, additional stakeholders so how do we get feedback from parents? We do that at parents' evenings um, and parent consultations from employers after events and activities and from pupils through student voice as well. Obviously, it's embedded within the SIP. So that's the other reporting data that we do. So it's a whole school improvement plan. Um, and as regards sustained destinations, we do through Compass Plus and through the school, we track student destinations for a minimum of three years. 
um, struggle with because of the same students are most vulnerable, they actually track further than that as well. I hope that's answered that question for me. Thank you, Penny. One more thing from for you, actually, uh, with working in a mainstream school that has an SEN setting, how is work experience differentiated? Are students who don't have special educational needs left to their own devices to get work experience places? And are students with SEN needs assisted to find work placements? Yeah, it's a blended model. It's a very much a blended model. So there's a big focus on uh, where they can. Uh, they, they are supported to find their own, but we feel that with the work that they do within careers, it's really important and part of their own personal development to learn those skills about going out and finding work experience and quality work experience places. Yeah. Obviously, those are assessed to make sure that they're the correct ones for the student. But where possible, students are encouraged and supported to find their own and their own opportunities. It's a big part of their learning and development. Um, and for the SEN students, then, yes, they are supported. Some of them, the higher performing, the higher functioning students are just the same as mainstream. So it's very much bespoke to the kind of pupil and pupil need. And it may be for, that for some of these students with severe SEN, that they may need to do some work experience within the school environment where they feel more supported yeah. as well. Thank you. And Jenny, I've got a question for you coming in. It's what was the awarding body for the level three making informed careers choices? Okay, it was the Welsh Board. Um, it is, is, we've just had to change to a different Welsh Board now because, if you, yeah, there's lots of um, changes within the um, accreditation routes that are available to entry level learners. And that's why we've had to do functional skills in post 16 now because the entry level literacy, adult literacy and numeracy has gone. So, yeah, we are struggling with some accreditation, but we have swapped. Now it was the Welsh board um, and now it's a, a different Welsh board, but it, it, I can't pronounce it, it's a Welsh name, but yes, it's through um, BSHE. Question coming in for both um, of our presenters today. How important is achieving your aims and following up on your destination data on pupils? So um, how important to achieving your aims, sorry, is following up on destination data for your pupils? Is that something that both of your schools do? So collecting destination data? LCC collect the destination data. I mean, we we would keep it because most of us come into our post sixteen anyway. We already know, but we do provide beyond um, our sort of key stage five destination data. I mean, to be honest, informally it comes back. We have students who who come back and um, you know come and talk to my current year 11s and post 16 about their journeys i had somebody in last week who did that um we've got young people who've you know I've, I've got a young person who um is involved in hallmark cards and he's going to be part we're putting together this short film with um, a local company who are going to do a short film to promote our young people so that we can send to employers so that's part of an interview so we don't follow up um, formally, but we're often doing things which means that we keep in touch with where our young people are at. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. And then we've only got time for one more question. Um, uh, we have a few on the board, so what we'll do is anyone who's sent a message and it hasn't been responded to, we'll send, we'll follow up directly with you. But we have one anonymous question, which was, what should governors be asking doing in light of government's SEND reviews? So in light of all of the legislative updates, is there anything key that you both feel that governors should be doing and asking? I think for me, it's about that embedding within the whole school structure. So it's yeah. is it on the school improvement plan. Is there a specific strategy for the most vulnerable within a mainstream setting? And how is, for governors, how, we really need to question the, the intent and the impact aspect of it. Um, for me, that's that's what that's what the important things are in the new SEND strategy for me. Jenny? Um, I think in a special school, it is all about the individual young person and what is an appropriate um, approach for them. And that, you know, I'm, I've done this work so long, you know, in, in the 80s and 90s, it was very much about um, integration and mainstreaming and, and actually giving everybody the same. Well, it, it isn't. It's about what is appropriate for them. If somebody can't see over a fence, they need the three crates or they might need the two crates. It isn't one size fits all. And, and for young people, different 
endpoints are appropriate for them. So I would never, and I've struggled with it, but over the years, come to somebody with PMLD, that employment is not their appropriate route, and it's been comfortable enough to be able to justify that and 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 speak about what is appropriate for young people's needs, because Ofsted are not always going to have a, a specialist on the team, and you take a it takes a long lot of um, explaining the world of SEN to them in a specialist setting because they are applying criteria which is just not appropriate um, yeah. in, in an SEND um, situation. Thank you very much Jenny and I'm afraid everyone that that brings our time today at the webinar to a close. I'd just like to thank everyone greatly for attending over your lunch period and a big thank you to both of our presenters Jenny and Penny today. It's been really great to hear from both of your insights and I'm very hopeful that the people on the call and myself will be able to reflect on that and use that in our own governance. Thank you to everyone who's taken part in All Pupils Every Ambition webinars to date. As we draw towards the end of the second term um, across the nation, we are also drawing to a close for the All Pupils Every Ambition term two. We're going to be sending a overview of what we've been looking at in the campaign from recordings from previous webinars, looking at the articles that we've presented and some of the materials and resources that are available for governors for schools. So check your inbox in the coming weeks for updates on that. And if you're interested in finding out more about the All Pupils Every Ambition campaign, you might be interested to know that next term we're going to be focusing on cultural capital, student enrichment, and that's going to be banded in a topic of empowered education. Thank you for attending today. Please do share this recording with the rest of your board and your school. And we hope to see you at another webinar from Governors for Schools in the future. Hope everyone has a lovely afternoon. Thank you for your time and we'll see you soon. Bye.